Welcome to this episode of the Vacation Rental Success Podcast. This episode is brought to you by the kind sponsorship from Owner Res, providing a powerful and flexible system for managing vacation rental properties. Owner Res provides booking and maintenance management, payment scheduling and collection, as well as insightful reporting. Owner Res will provide you with a long-term booking foundation that is scalable for your vacation rental business while fully managing your channel listings, but still focusing on your brand, your website, and your way of doing things. Listen in to the mid-episode break where you will hear more about this internationally recognized leader in vacation rental software. For more information about Owner Res, click the link in the description of this episode on your smart device. Let's get started. Here is your host, Heather Bayer. Happy 2023. And in this episode, I am talking, as I always do at the beginning of a new year, to Andrew McConnell of Rented.com. And we're looking back over the last year, looking forward to the new one and talking about convergence, consolidation and contraction. So listen in. This is an interesting discussion. This is the Vacation Rental Success Podcast, keeping you up to date with news, views, information and resources on this rapidly changing short-term rental business. I'm your host, Heather Bayer, and with 25 years of experience in this industry, I'm making sure you know what's hot, what's not, what's new and what will help make your business a success. Well, hello and welcome to another episode of the Vacation Rental Success Podcast and the first one of 2023. Gosh, these years seem to go by really, really rapidly. So I just had my first Christmas without snow for ooh, 20 years and, and actually I really quite enjoyed it. Down here on the Gulf Coast of Alabama, the sun was shining and it was a very pleasant alternative to watching snow out the window, chipping off ice from the windscreen, etc. Don't know what we'll be doing next year. Maybe I'll backtrack and spend another Christmas in Ontario, but we shall see. Anyhow, all speed ahead for a new year. And I know all of you will have so many plans for the new year. We always do this. We, we set our goals. We start mapping out what the next few months is going to bring us. And we all head into a new year with lots of motivation and hopefully some inspiration. And that's what I wanted to bring to you today. As ever, on the first episode of a new year, I talked to Andrew McConnell from Rented.com. And in the last couple of years, we've actually been doing, bi- is it biannual? So we, I do an interview with Andrew the first episode of January, and then we do it towards the end of June as well. So because the last few years, it, things have been pretty hectic and lots of changes in the air. So while this continues to be the same, I will probably be talking to Andrew every six months as we go on. Certainly over in uh, 2023, I will be doing that. But today we are talking about, you know, what went down in 2022. And of course, there was so much. There were so many people who sold their businesses. There was a lot more consolidation going on. There was a ton of money still coming into the industry. So I want to talk about that. Ask Andrew what impact it had on him and his business. Also want to ask him about the sale of his book, Uh, He wrote the book called Get Out of My Head, Creating Modern Clarity with Stoic Wisdom. And that was published back last June. And I know it was doing really, really well. So I want to catch up with him on that, see what feedback he's got. And then uh, we're going to be looking forward, looking at the changing of the guard in many areas of the industry and how that illustrates the theme that we're bringing to today's discussion, which is of contraction, consolidation and convergence. So without further ado, let's move on over to my interview with Andrew McConnell. So once again, super happy to have with me today, Andrew McConnell from Rented.com. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. 
It's great to be here. Yeah, well, it always is. This is the time of year that is so set in concrete for me. You know, beginning of the season, we talk to you and get your take on what went down in the past year and what's upcoming in the new year. However, having having just had a chat with you before I pressed the record button and you saying you're not that good at forecasting, and I think it was because, <laughs> you know, a couple of years ago, you took off to, I say took off, you relocated to Bermuda for a month because the Bermudans were allowing people to come in during COVID and set up. And here you are three years later. Yeah. And it's still rolling. My <laughs> wife just renewed her residency permit. So it's very open-ended right now. But you're still loving it, right? I am. Yeah, I mean, we have great friend group here. The our back stairs go into the ocean. So this morning, swimming with huge parrot fish and all sorts of angel fish, everything around. Uh, it's it's pretty great. Yeah, it sounds like something that uh, that would bring joy into your life because I know you love the swimming. I do. I love the swimming. I, I I also say, and this might tie back to another one of the podcasts that I can be happy anywhere. Right. Like it's a it's a mindset of find what I love, love what I find. And it's two sides of that equation. And so I, I love it here. I loved it in Atlanta. I loved it when I lived in Cambridge, Massachusetts or Cambridge, UK or Copenhagen. You know, I, I can be happy anywhere. Well, you know, th- that, that's a great segue into just having a quick chat about the book. Get out of my head. Yeah. Because that was published last year, and it sounds very much like you're walking the talk from the book. So, how, how has that gone? How has the how, how have sales gone? You you hit bestseller lists. Tell us about where it is now. Yeah, I mean, it has to be for me the personally most rewarding thing I've probably ever done. Right. So, helping people with their businesses, and make more money, and, and getting the feedback that that's been great. But having people reach out and say my life is different and better today uh, after reading your book that that's saying, wow, you know, that that's why I wrote it. Cause you say I'm walking the walk and it's not always easy to walk the walk. So much of it, these are exercises I have to go back to. I continually use. And that's why I wanted to document them and share them because this isn't a one-off. This isn't like you eat healthy for a week and then you <laughs> never have to eat healthy again. Or you go to the gym for a month and then you never exercise again. It's These are things, your, your mental health, your physical health, that you have to invest in continuously. It, it's part of life. And it's not a one and done thing. And so my wife says, wait, how can I write this book? You're not perfect at this. I said, that's, that's exactly <laughs> why I can write this book because I'm not perfect at it. And I have to work at it because that's what it is. And so it, I think it's, it's totally resonating and working. That's wonderful. I still have it open on my desk a lot of the time. I pick it up and it's it's one of those books that you can pick up and just start a chapter and be inspired and motivated. So Thank it's you. I love it. You still haven't signed it because I never made it to, <laughs> to an event that you were at. So wherever I go, I'm going to be bringing this book so I can finally get your signature onto it. I'll put a link in the show notes for anybody who's not sure what I'm talking about. Um, it's uh, Andrew's book, Get Out of My Head, Creating Modern Clarity with Stoic Wisdom was published last June. And it really is a great read. If you haven't got a copy, get one. There's so many great stories. Every, and I think that's what I get. It's I, now I read a lot of personal development and self-help books and the best ones are the ones that, that tell stories. That's, you know, tell stories about mm. people I know, people I don't know. And I come away in, so inspired. You know, there was that, there was a story of, of, and I never knew that you'd run the bulls in Pamplona. And, yeah. you know, what, what a fabulous story that was. So there's, yeah, there's so, so many stories in there. Get that book. Okay. We normally kick off this discussion with talking about the year that's just gone. And it was pretty monumental for me. <laughs> it, was, it was quite monumental for many other people in this industry. But I, I'm going to sort of turn it over to you because I can talk about my experience of selling a business, which, uh, what I think was exactly the right time. But I know that you've 
talked to many, many other people who've done similar things. And, and I w- would like to get your take on the highlights of 2022 in the vacation rental market, in the, in, in the industry. What were the biggest surprises and what came at no surprise at all? That was a funny thing, preparing for this, thinking about, okay, if we were looking back at 2022, what is the headline of the year? And you know, I think there's this line of there are decades where nothing happens and then there are weeks where decades happen. <laughs> and this year seemed like one of those that kind of decades so much happened this year. So obviously you being a huge name and, and personality in the industry, selling was a big thing. And then it happened at the same time as another giant of podcasting in the industry, Sarah Bird sold her business. And other female giants, Amy in Tybee, Jody in Deep Creek, Dawn at Miss Kitties, all of this, you know, just foundational women of the industry sold at very similar times. And it's it's more than that. That there's so many, so many businesses. Mike Harrington sold, Southern down in the panhandle sold. It, it was just so much activity. And then we talk about the the monumental uh, personally, right? Rented, we sold. I, I sold my company. And so that that's own I did its not own journey. I didn't know that. Why do I not know that? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I don't know. <laughs> I introduced yeah. you as Andrew McConnell from Rented.com, so it's no longer. Yeah. Well, it is. Yeah, yeah. I'm still with Rented, so the, the we're part of the TravelNet Solutions family now. Right. I did know so that. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm yes, I did. They're yeah. running Rented, but under a bigger yeah. umbrella, and and so serving ever more clients really believe in what they've been building for the past two decades there and continue to build mm-hmm. and, and very excited for that. So I, I think the consolidation and convergence continues, right? I think some of the names we already talked about with the consolidation of all these companies getting bought up, whether it's on the manager side or on the technology side and the convergence, Mike Harrington was part of this big move of all these former presidents of the VRMA sold their companies. So Steve Milo and V bought Mike Carrington's company and that was the vacation rental arm. So Mike had been doing a thing for a few years, was managing vacation rentals, but he was also buying up these old motels, hotels and revamping them to make them kind of this blended hotel vacation mm-hmm. rental experience with kitchenettes and I'm redesigning the whole thing. And he's gone all in on that and continues to expand in Oak Island and elsewhere. And just a, a perfect example of this convergence of, of what's happening. You know, we're, we're in the process, uh, me and my, my business partner here in uh, Bermuda of bidding on a contract for a bunch of vacation rentals, but also potentially kind of some hostels that we can take over and manage again on that blending of what is that hotel? What is that vacation rental experience? And I think this is something we're going to see more and more Uh, focus. Focus rate just put out data that I think it was 64% of people stayed in a vacation rental looked at hotels as well. So before it was, hey, if I'm going to a vacation rental, it's specific to vacation rental. If I'm going to a hotel, that's all I'm looking at. And now more than half the time, people are saying, you know, honestly, I could go either way on this. Mm-hmm. What is the right thing for this trip? And so 36% of the time people say, no, we're gone for a week. It's a big family. Of course, we're going to do a vacation rental. We're not looking at any hotels. But almost two thirds of the time, people are saying we can go both ways. And that that's interesting for both sides of the equation. Hotels... With what Marriott's doing, you know, they just announced their uh, service apartment new launch in the U.S. They're blending into the vacation rental from the hotel side. We have the extended stay, longer stay. And so there's real competition coming and, and already existing, pushing into hotels and hotels pushing in to what we have traditionally considered our realm and domain. So that's that's the, the convergence side. Right? We have the consolidation and convergence. And then one thing we started to see for those that really maximized in 2020 and 2021 when it was gangbusters and you kept putting the prices to see where the ceiling was and it didn't seem like there was a ceiling, 
uh, we see in 2022, and I think we're going to continue to see in 2023, some markets where there's contraction of, yes, the category is growing, especially now that people are back to urban travel. But for the traditional leisure and resort markets, I think we're going to start to see some contraction, even in an in inflationary environment, right? So people are expecting, oh, it's hyperinflation. My prices should go up. Well, yeah. A lot of markets, they got ahead of that inflation a year or two in advance, pushed all those prices up, and, and there's not as much room to do it. As people mm-hmm. are feeling the pinch, these travel dollars are discretionary dollars. And while the luxury end, I think, can continue to push up because those people never seem to get hurt, <laughs> people who are buying luxury, it's that middle tier. Oof. Yeah. yeah. I mean, you're really competing against hotels and you're competing against groceries and gasoline and other things people have to buy. I mean, you're, you're seeing some real wallet retra- uh, contraction uh, as well as ADR contraction. So I think this is something we're going to continue to see. Um, in terms of what else happened this year, you know, right as we were finishing last year, Vacasa went pre- public. Mm-hmm. And right as we started off 2022, Sonder went public. And man, was that a... Uh, oof. Has that been a year for for both of them? Right, I think investors poured hundreds of millions of dollars into Vacas. It's now trading. They they took it public at billions, and it's now trading at less than the investors put in. Mm-hmm. I think Sonder was a similar way. Some like eight hundred million dollars got poured into it, and it's valued at two hundred million now. And it's a it's an interesting time where you say, wait, all these companies are getting bought, so there there's some companies doing really well and making money out of this. But then the really high profile ones, people outside the industry aren't getting that same benefit. And, and why is that? What's going on? It has seemed to deter money pouring into the industry. You still hear of companies very much wanting to invest in good managers and, and where the money is and technology firms. So obviously very, very big financing rounds at TravelNet Solutions, very, very big financing rounds at Guesty and others that Avantio sold, Transparent sold, AirDNA, right? There, there's still plenty of money coming in. So I think it's just coming in the companies that make money. Mm-hmm. You have to show that you can actually make money doing this. And the idea of we can mortgage A and magically make money in the future. If you weren't making money in the best of times, it's very, very hard to believe that somehow when things started getting tougher, you're going to magically be able to flip a switch and start making money in that environment. Yeah. Let's talk a little bit about Airbnb and yes. and what happened with Airbnb in the latter part of, of, of 2022 with the, the whole issue of cleaning fees and other feedback that they were getting from guests that was obviously spooking them. Yeah. So, I mean... Airbnb could have its own secret podcast, obviously, <laughs> uh, with everything going on there. Just they're, they're such a big player. It, it's interesting because coming out of Q3, all these travel companies had their best quarter ever. Expedia, mm-hmm. Booking, Airbnb, record, record revenues and, and profits. And then the market did not reward Airbnb for that. They, they were making more money than ever, but the market was actually dinging. And can you can you explain what the, you the, what, what what do you mean by that? The market was dinging them. I mean, it, their share price went down, so they mm-hmm. come out and they're ahead of earnings. They're making more money than ever as a company, and people, say, oh, you're now worth less than you were yesterday. Mm-hmm. Like, okay, now why is this? And I think it's you start. It doesn't matter about today. It matters about what does the long term future look like. And I think they were seeing a lot of slowing of growth. It, the, the big thing, and this is what managers have said for the longest time, supply is king. Who has the, who owns the inventory? And as a distribution platform, Airbnb has been absolutely incredible at building that brand awareness for guests and for consumers. But they haven't always been the best friend of the professional manager, right? Because right. they, they got started for the individual host, for the shared accommodation. Their whole bread and butter wasn't vacation rentals. It was shared urban accommodations. It was, mm-hmm. hey, I have the spare bedroom. 
please pay me some money to come stay here. And so I think what we're seeing kind of 10 years later, 2022, is very similar environment potentially to what we saw Airbnb 2008 to 2012. They launched in 2008 on the back end of the financial crisis, and there was this real economic contraction. So that's where they'd have the shared accommodation. And two, if they were traveling, they were looking for more cost efficient ways to do so. And so Airbnb initially got started as, hey, we're cheaper than hotels, right? That was that was kind of period of, oh, it's cheaper than hotels. 10 years down the line, that's not the case anymore. Mm -hmm. Right now that they were such a big distribution platform, so many vacation rentals and other properties ended up in there that the price is up. Right. If there's the demand, we're going to put prices. It's not about being cheaper. It's about a better service. It's about a unique experience. And I think what he's learning in that is, whoa, these managers, <laughs> they're potentially less dependent on it. Right. You look at some companies, some local companies are getting 90 plus percent direct bookings. They don't need Airbnb as much as Airbnb needs their supply. And so what Airbnb is trying to do is build more of a closed garden, a walled off garden to attract new supply as the economy contracts again. What they're doing is trying to say, hey, we want to build the next generation of hosts, the next generation of people who are going to put their properties in, who need this income, who are going to be the small managers built fairly on our platform, be entirely dependent on us, as opposed to us just being one of the many channels they put on. And it's a lot of the changes that they put in place, I think, are, are trying to build these tools for hosts as opposed to managers. But they also have to keep guests happy. There's been a lot of a lot of anger on, I see $129 a night, but then I go and there's this cleaning fee and there's this fee and there's this fee and, and I end up paying $467. Like, where, did, where did that come from? And so it, it's, a, it's a tough situation with any marketplace of you need to make both sides happy. But the the hard side actually of the equation is the supply because people are going to want a place to stay, but supply mm -hmm. can go distribute anywhere. So where do you see this going in, uh, in 2023? 2023, I, I do think, yeah, I, there'll be, there'll be a lot of people that entered the industry in the gangbuster years and say, oh, I can become a millionaire. <laughs> who are going to have a very hard time, right? If you were built your entire business model based on the best of times, as we go into the tighter market, you're going to have a very difficult time. For those that weren't even making money in the best of times, they're off hanging up, like get out before you lose your shirt. If you couldn't make money back in 21, things aren't getting, things get better than that in foreseeable future there. If you built a great business and you have a great profitable business, you can sit it out. You can, you know how to go through this, right? There's so many of these managers who've been through the OA crisis and know how to turn the crisis into an opportunity and, and deliver. But I mean, you can see it in social media. You can see it on all these posts of what's going on. Where are all my bookings? I bought this property expecting these kinds of returns. Like, well, I don't know who was giving you this advice. I mean, you bought at a record price when you had record rental income, but the only thing that's going to be a constant is the record price. The rental income can go up and down. <laughs> but it's going to stay the same is whatever you paid that day you bought the property. And so that buying at record asset prices is, is just a very dangerous proposition. We saw this in Ontario, just watched with horror, in fact, as, as this all went down in 2021, mostly, mm -hmm. and the you know, bidding wars and people buying properties with absolutely no backup of home inspections of, of any sort. And I, do you, you know what? People without even sight, like without yes. even going to look at the property, they were yeah. paying record amounts for properties they never saw. Yes, there was one. I, I went to see the property on the same day that the owners had seen it for the first time, and yeah. they just paid 200000 over asking for it. And Whoa. I, I was, how can you do this? <laughs> how can, you know, I, they're, they're going to go along, they're going to see the property for the first time, they're taking along the, the rental manager who's going to look after it, and we're, we're all seeing it 
as I say, for the for the first time. And fortunately, yeah. fortunately, they loved it. And and it's been a very good prospect for them. It was a very good prospect for them then. It is slowing down now. It's slowing. It, it's it's slowing down for everybody. Maybe not so much for them. It was a high end property. You mentioned earlier on that once you're in that luxury bracket, it really isn't changing a huge amount. Yeah. And I've said this many many times that the the people who are out there looking at spending. You know, ten thousand, fifteen thousand dollars a week. They're not worried about the the odd five hundred extra or a thousand dollars a week extra here and there. That income is going to come in for those for those people in that market. But I do feel for those who did the same thing for a more modest property, going for that middle market because that middle market. Yeah. And you know, we we were seeing it a while ago, and I know it's still going on that that is that is dropping off. People are just not affording. It's the first thing that goes out the window, isn't it? That that discretionary spending. Exactly. I mean, it's the the budget side always has a place. The luxury side, they always have money. It mm -hmm. always has a place. And it's just how much you're able to get in that fat metal varies. And if it's commoditized fat metal, it can be a race to the bottom because then you're competing against anything that looks relatively similar. They're not paying for this incredible one of a kind mm -hmm. property, and they're you didn't enter it expecting, okay, very low margin, like cheapest that we can do. And that's, that's just a very dangerous, a dangerous place to play regardless of your industry. And especially in our industry where you're talking about real estate, where people are spending you know, their savings. Like this isn't buying a small item. This is investment in your life. Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. So, so that that's something I think we're going to be seeing in greater proportion as we go into this new year. Well, I'm just going to take a short break from the interview with Andrew here to go over to Paul Waldschmidt, the chief executive officer and co-founder of Onores, our sponsor. And Paul is answering another question that potential clients of Onores often ask. <laughs> So, Paul, welcome back. What do your clients typically tell you about the value that owner ads brings to their business? Yeah, there, we see this routinely, actually, in our testimonials or reviews, user stories. People will come to us and they'll talk about, I was able to grow with owner res. And they say a lot of things, but that line kind of always stands out to me because in any business, if your business is failing, you don't do more of it, uh, right? Businesses that tend to be that tend to grow tend to be businesses that are succeeding, at least on some level. And in the vacation rental space, there are owners who do fail, who do end up walking away or they bought in at too high of a price or it's just something that they decided they don't want to do. So when we see owners come back to us, particularly when they're transitioning from homeowner sized businesses to PMs, the starter PM, small PM space is where we see a lot of these testimonials where people will come back and say, the ability to keep doing what I was doing as a homeowner, but then just quickly expand that out from one or two properties to eight or 10. And now I'm managing for my friends and man, it all just kind of keeps working. The channel management, the website, you know, it, it scales well, it's still fast. It still works exactly as it did with one. So typically we see the value where there's that transition homeowner to PM in that starter and small range. Well, thank you, Paul, for those comments on Onores. So back to my interview with Andrew McConnell. What else do you see? What do you see as opportunities for managers as we start 2023? Yeah, I think there's there's a lot of opportunity in terms of signing owners because there's going to be so much churn. Not that the manager that has them today even necessarily did anything wrong, but people are going to look for scapegoats. Mm -hmm. And when the numbers are not matching what the magic spreadsheet told them when they acquired the property or what it looked like in 21 or in 20, they're going to want to blame somebody. And it's likely going to be their existing manager, even if they did everything right. So being there and ready to tell the story of how and why you were different and better 
what you're going to be able to do on revenue generation for that homeowner, that is going to be the biggest opportunity. Mm -hmm. I think there's also, with all the input pouring in to the technology space, there are opportunities to implement new technologies, new systems, new software into your business. They can be game changing in terms of how you run it. Uh, so as you're adding these properties, how how can you run them more efficiently? Mm-hmm. How can you take tasks off of your plate that other people can do more efficiently, right? It, it should always be, okay, of what I'm doing, what can we just stop? What's not going to hurt us if we stop? If we can't stop it, can we automate it? Can we use software or some kind of automation? And then can it automate? Can it go to a cheaper resource than me? And then you, as a business owner, as the manager, as whatever it is, what is it that you uniquely can do that others can't? Okay, look, I'm the mayor. I grew up here. I went to high school here. The, the literal mayor is my buddy from middle school. I can build relationships with owners unlike anyone else in my business. And that's the single biggest act that I can have on my business. Well, then every hour that can go towards owner recruitment and retention that you can put in, that's more valuable than anything else. Because you can hire people to do everything else, but they're not going to be able to do that. Or I am the most incredible design eye, and I can go into any property and show them exactly how to change things around to make it go up in value, you know, from that mid tier to the luxury in terms of those and what people are getting. Well, great. Put more and more time into that. Like find what your unique value to the business is and put it your time into that higher outsource, automate, stop anything else. Yeah, that is such such great advice because I think we've gone through, you know, we went through the formative years of this before technology really came into its own where every owner, manager had to be master of all trades, had to do everything. Right. And now we do have that luxury of choosing what we're, we're good at and yeah. maximizing on that and letting the rest go to third parties, whether it's, whether it's staff or whether it's automated software. Yeah. I mean, if you think about starting a business today versus 10 years ago versus 20 years ago, where 20 years ago, you didn't really have online distribution. I guess VRBO exists, but Airbnb didn't, Home Away didn't yet, right? Like you had this whole world that didn't exist on distribution. You had, it had to be you because you couldn't afford to hire anybody else. But now you have stuff like extend team. You're like, actually, I can to my team in this super, super efficient way. And then the software accessibility, you can start, it's dangerous, but you could start just using Airbnb. Right. That, that's the whole thing. They're trying to build out that suite. If you just have one home and then you have two and then you have three. And OK, w- at what point does it make sense to say, OK, now I need to start looking outside software. I can't have my entire livelihood dependent on this third party channel that you hear too many horror stories of. Oh, yeah, they just turned me off or they held all, all my revenue and, and wouldn't pay it out. And so at what point does it make sense to start building that tech stack, that tech stack? doesn't have to be expensive. There's so many options. I mean, you've seen the landscape. There's so many options and there's no singularly right answer of it. There's the right answer for you at this stage of your company's development. And so the right answer today at one property running for a few months a year, it'd just be Airbnb. Hey, I'm not going to complicate it. Once you get a handful of homes, okay, maybe look at one of these lighter weight PMSs. And then I can start distributing on other channels. I can do better guest communication. Et cetera. And then if you're building a real company and you're hiring other people, okay, now I need sophisticated enterprise solutions. All of these are out there. And that wasn't necessarily the case 10, 20 years ago. I mean, it's a very different world now. Yeah. And I'm, I'm testament to that. You know, when we started, there, yeah. there was, there was nothing we, you know, it was back in the day of fax machines and, and checks in the mail. Yeah. So yeah, and, and I guess I guess there are there are fewer and fewer of us now who experience that. So we were there. You know, we've we've sort of come. And I, we've said this before that we, you know, for, for for many of those companies, you've come. We've come full circle. We were direct book, and then we we 
immersed ourselves in home away then airbnb and then came out the other side going back to direct book but we had that experience of it before so we yeah. we knew the strategies and the tactics the actions that we could take but i think for for many you know how how do they know how do they learn this by doing <laughs> you learn by doing this is this is one of those look conferences are great and you can sit in the, the session and hear and take some notes and to your peers even better of somebody who's actually done it but doing it yourself and say okay yeah 80 percent of it's the same as what heather did and i'm really learning from that but this market at this time or my <laughs> particular owners or my particular market it has these little nuances that are different that i'm only gonna know and learn and know how to respond to once i start doing and so first do to keep up in mind because back to there's no singularly right answer. It's just the right answer for you at this point in time. Well, that point in time is going to change. You change. It's back to the Heraclitus. No man steps in the same river twice because it's not the same river and he's not the same man. It's the same for you. Your business is not the same and the market is not the same. So you need to constantly do stuff like this, right? Listening to these podcasts, hearing what's happening in the industry, staying on top of what's happening in your market, what's happening with guests, what's happening with your technology partners and distribution partners so that you can adapt and evolve as necessary to stay ahead of the market. Yeah, I I love what what you said about there is there is no right answer. That there's no there's no cookie cutter solution. Right. For anybody in the business, whether you whether you just have the one property or whether you've got a hundred or a thousand, there's no one way of doing it. And I, I certainly know that. And I and I know that uh, Pillar Forty Nine, who bought our company, mm -hmm. you know, they're they're going off in different directions. They're making their own path now and doing things that I wish we'd done years ago. They they didn't cross my mind, or. Maybe I didn't have the right motivation. But yes, and I think I think a lot of people who are maybe starting out on the property manager route think that there is the, the one. I just have to do this pattern of things and everything's going to go right. But that's, that's just not, not the case. My answer was always try something. If it doesn't work, do something different. Yeah, I mean, that's the thing. That, that is the difficult thing because there are people out there that will sell you, hey, here's how to get rich. Here's the playbook, the playbook. Here's what to do. Well, there is no the playbook. Hey, here are things that can work and have worked for others at a certain point in time for their particular business. And some of those things may be totally right for you. But guess what? It changes, right? The business is built entirely on Google AdWords. That was amazing for a point in time when it wasn't competitive and you're buying AdWords for $2.50. When it's $200, the economics break. Facebook ads, that totally worked for a period of time when they were cheap and you could target to the end user. One, it stopped being cheap. Two, Apple changed their privacy uh, policy and it, it's not as targeted anymore. It doesn't work. And so you have, to, it's not just our industry, it's any business. You have to change as the business changes. You have to change operating and changes. And if anybody's telling you, oh, here's the way to do it, well, they're lying. Or just wrong. I, I don't know. I always say uh, to incompetence rather than malice. So maybe maybe they're just wrong. They're not <laughs> being malicious, but it's it's not a realistic take on uh, on a market dynamic as this is. Right? This is a market that's five x over the last twenty years. You know, this year the U.S. alone is supposed to do fifty percent more than the entire global industry did back in the year two thousand. Just way too big. And growing way too fast for there to be, oh, this is the right way to do it. Mm -hmm. So do you think, there's, is there, are we going to have any surprises? I mean, here I'm putting you in the spot and saying predict the surprises of 2023. <laughs> but is there anything out there that's, that's showing signs that it could impact the industry and maybe something that we should be aware of? Yeah, I mean, I... I would say, and maybe I shouldn't have been surprised because with the consolidation convergence, I think it was just sheer number that all sold at the same time, especially for the tier of managers that did, including yourself. That was surprising. And the fact that somewhere it wasn't surprising, it was 
the name brands and the volume of, that it happened in. I think as we look in the surprises going forward, I think we may be surprised who wins and who doesn't uh, in the coming year of people who got a lot of attention and some that didn't and how that plays out. But for me, we are now in another 2008 to 2012 time period. So if you go back in years, Airbnb wasn't a thing. I mean, it was just, it was so nascent. It was just getting started. Travel Net Solutions, Track wasn't a PMS. Guesty was not a thing. Mm -hmm. Vacasa was not a thing. All these names that dominate the conversations today did not exist 10 to 15 years ago. Or we're not in the mind's eye at the same point. And as we see this chaos, as we see the economy contract, as we see compression on our ADRs, the exciting part is the companies we're going to be talking about in 10 years, they don't exist yet. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we don't, they're not household names yet. And so this is the opportunity is for those that can come in with fresh eyes and say, hey, I'm not tied to the old way of doing things. I see all of this chaos and flux. And instead of holding on to what I have today, I see this as a huge opportunity to do something new and different. And that to me is a surprise of what is going to get created. You know, is it something like Mount, you know, what she's doing in terms of monetizing at the homeowner level, all these ancillary sites. So you can rent the bikes. I, I can monetize all the pieces Okay, she, she's going to talk about a little bit today, but is that going to be the Airbnb of 10 years from now? I, I think that's the exciting thing. Of what is it that's just getting created today that's just going to take over the conversation and, and the market? That means that they're truly exciting part. How do you find these things that are just being created today? I, I used to be, I used to be years ago, I, I would say, I, you know, I, I jumped on every new thing that came along. And I seem to have that, that knack of finding this new stuff and jumping on it. A lot of it, you know, I'm very happy that I, I did. But where do you look? And I, th I think perhaps what I'm saying is one thing that I think all owners and managers should be doing is, is reading and networking and looking around them outside of their own business and see what's happening outside. Where do they find this information? Yes. I mean, one is talking to each other. Right, Be, being part of the community, looking outside the industry. I mean, probably I, I could be wrong, but when you say you were jumping on stuff and looking at other things, I mean, think about it. you created podcasting for this industry, right? Podcasting. Think about when you started podcasting. If people have called peak podcasting forever, I, I, uh, Cliff was like, "Oh, maybe there are too many podcasts." I was like, "Are there? I, does anybody say there are too many books? We shouldn't publish any more books." <laughs> Podcasting is another way of getting information out there. And so I think being willing and able to look outside the industry, not just within the industry, you, you see all sorts of opportunities. So that could be for create businesses of what are the corollaries? What have other industries gone through and how did they come out the other side? How did that work? That's a huge opportunity. And in terms of the new ideas coming through, it's keeping that open mind. It, it's, it's reading, right? It's listening to podcasts like this, following Skift and Focuswire and short-term rentals, and just seeing what the buzz is, as well as going to the conferences, as well as talking to your peers. And you don't have to do it all, all the time, but there's a reason on my calendar, I have specific times and days of the week dedicated to read and learning because it's changing so much. If I don't, I'm behind. Mm -hmm. I don't know what's happening unless I invest that time to go learn about what's happening and go try to investigate it. And so if that's something you care about, which you should, if you want to be in existence and relevant come next year, come 10 years, then you need to invest the time and dedicate to investigating what's going on. What are the new things out there? And you, that doesn't mean you have to be the early adopter and like, okay, I'm going to sign for sign up for every new piece of software that comes out. It's just, you need to be aware of it. You need to find who's on it, talk to them, their feedback, how is it helping or not, mm -hmm. and just stay on top of it. So when we come back and talk again in June, which I, I hope we will, what do you think we'll be talking about then? I think we'll be talking about some flux in terms of some of the companies. I think that 2022 was hard for some people, especially the back half. 
uh, because they their businesses on certain assumptions and certain ways of operating that stopped holding true. And I expect to see that accelerate in 2023. And I think we're going to be just like we talked about, wow, all these things are doing so great in 2022 and sales and companies growing. I think we're, we'll be talking a little bit about the other side of the equation, as well as I hope, what are the new exciting things we're seeing? Wow. This, this one, we didn't even, didn't even see it coming <laughs> six months ago. Didn't know it existed, but wow, what an exciting thing. If I knew what it was, I would tell you, I just don't know what that exciting thing or those two exciting things are, but I'm, I'm really hopeful because it's, it is in these times of chaos and flux that the new exciting things take off. It, it's those people that can see things differently and build things differently uh, that make the, the difference that continue to drive not just our industry, but the global economy. And what will you be doing this year outside of rented.com? Outside of rented, I mean, I'll continue doing speaking and workshops around get out of my head. So doing a lot of personal development work for companies, uh, events and, and corporate workshops, trying to invest in people and, and mental health and well-being and working with TravelNet Solutions to, to get that enterprise solution out for, for more and more managers and, and solving that. I'll be swimming a lot this month. <laughs> It'll be nice and warm here in Bermuda. Yeah. Well, I don't li- live in a great life. Well, I hope we, I, I do hope we get to meet sometime in 2023. So you will sign my book until then. Well, come visit. Yeah. Oh gosh. Bermuda. Yes. That would be lovely. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Bermuda. Do it. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much, uh, Andrew. Or as ever, it's always an absolute pleasure to have you on the show. It's the highlight of, you know, one of the highlights of my podcasting year to do this. It sort of sets the scene for a new year and and I hope we continue to do it for many years to come. Let's do it. It's always (laughs) a pleasure. Thank you, Heather. Thank you. Thank you so much, Andrew McConnell, as ever, delivering some great insights and discussion on where we've come from in 2022, where we're going to in 2023, and a lot of food for thought there. Just talking to Andrew after we recorded the interview, he has so many great quotes that uh, I was trying to make notes as we went along. One of them is, uh, no man steps in the same river twice. So I'm going to research that one a bit more. And then a couple of the others, and I'll make sure they're in the show notes. Because some of these, I I love quotes, and I I sort of hang them on my wall and put them on my computer screen as desktop material, and they inspire and motivate me. So uh, if you're interested in some of those really great quotes that Andrew came up with, and of course you've forgotten about them now because that's what happens when you listen to something. You think, oh, that's great. I'll remember that, but you don't. But don't forget that we we are now transcribing the podcasts, so you will find the full transcription on the show notes. So if there's something that you think you missed, you'd like to go back to, you can go back to the written version, which for some people I know is very, very helpful. So that's it for the first episode of the new year. I hope you enjoyed that. There's a lot of really, really good stuff to come. I hope you stay with us. Hope you subscribe. Would love it if you wrote me a review as well. That's always nice to have. So until next week, enjoy whatever you're doing with the rest of your day. And I'll be with you again soon. This episode was brought to you by OwnerRes. For more information about this internationally recognized leader in vacation rental software, click the link in the description of this episode on your smart device or head over to vacationrentalformula.com forward slash owner res to find out more. It's been a pleasure as ever being with you. If there's anything you'd like to comment on, then join the conversation on the show notes for the episode at vacationrentalformula.com. We'd love to hear from you. And I look forward to being with you again next week.